for Selena. Be oh, you I got an email that said that I thought my my recording option was deleted or something from Zoom. It gets rid of the oldest ones and keeps the newest ones, so you're okay. All right, good. I'm so glad you came on to press record like that just in time. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, what did Casey want? Or you can't probably can't say it on here. So, okay. Uh, good. So I'm pretty excited. I'm ready to get started. Let's see. <laughs> Coach Katie, that's a song. Have you heard it? It's a country Western song. Me and her go way back like Cadillac seats. All right. Um, uh, I just, uh, okay. Let's, uh, did you, you are recording. Okay. It just didn't look like it there. So I just came back from um, something called Oakland A's Fantasy Camp, and um, that's why I titled the email Lessons from a Professional Ball Player. Um, my wife and I, and uh, there's a few people on here also who have taken the similar personal development courses that I have taken. And uh, because of that, uh, you start to be more aware of people and people's reactions and people's energy and things like that. More particularly, you get to be a little bit more aware of your energy, your reactions, and whether or not they're serving you. So in this business of real estate, we have a lot of emotional crap that keeps us uh, from possibly, excuse me, possibly from being all that we can be. And what I mean by that is that I was personally just amazed, amazed uh, at when we, you know, we were, if you don't know what fantasy camp is, you literally get to pretend you get to go to Oakland A's, Oakland Athletics, the professional baseball team's training facilities in Mesa, Arizona, and you are essentially treated like a professional ball player for six days meaning you're playing baseball, you get a full uniform, an official uniform with your name on the back. Uh, when you get undressed at night uh, and you leave your stuff, you come back in the morning, all your laundry's done and hung. Your, your cleats have been cleaned and shined by somebody. Um, if you have an owie or you're sore, uh, they tell you what to do. They have a they have what looks like a hot tub, but it's 32 degree water or 34 degree water. And then they have a hot tub next to it so that they say, oh, get in the cold tub, sit there for four minutes and then move over to the hot tub. And if you're finishing up the day, they want you to finish in cold. That's your last one. And if you're starting the day, they want you to finish in hot. Like all these things, you get your hand, pull a hammy, they go in, they work on you, they treat you. This is the same level of service that the best athletes in the world get. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. You get your hotel, your, your breakfast and lunch every day. Uh, it's, it was an amazing experience, but on this big, uh, portable whiteboard that was in there, I was surprised at how much mindset stuff was written on the board. And I started to relate it instantly to my real estate business. There was 75 of us, five women and 70 men. Um, and then those are people who paid to be in fantasy camp, meaning you get to play, you get a uniform. Casey, we we brought my wife along as a fan. She had a, she bought a fan package, which means she could come wherever we went, but didn't play, didn't get a uniform, that kind of stuff. So it was a really, really incredible experience. So when I said that on the email, uh, for any of those you got it, again, remember um, if you if you put your email address in the um, in the chat, we'll add you to the the email drip if you haven't been getting it. Um, so it's been it was really exciting, and a couple of the things that really brought to were brought to my attention on that board was these different concepts they had on there. They had on the board a concept called the difference between a cue and a trigger, and I don't want to do anything with that right now. I just want you to hold on to those two words and ask yourself if you get the difference between a cue and a trigger and what happens with a cue versus what happens with a trigger. And the biggest trick in there, by the way, is can you turn a trigger into a cue? It's a really subtle mindset shift. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Then up on the board, they had something that said the concept of 
me versus you versus the concept of me versus me. And I love that. Like, think about that. That So I asked a couple of the coaches. The coaches were all former Oakland A's, professional baseball players. Uh, Ray, for, can you say that trigger thing again? That was cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. So all they had on the board was the words. Q is a good thing. A trigger is not a good thing. That's what they wrote on the board, right? But in, you know, just me looking at it every day, I started to think, what if you could turn every trigger into a Q to either A, not react, uh, check your reactions, ask why I'm having those reactions, things like that, so that a trigger would turn into a cue for you, meaning it would be a notification that, ah, I can do this and I will get a positive result out of this. Um, so uh, I was talking, I would, I mean, come on, you guys, you got to remember that a lot of these guys are people I idolized and now we're just hanging around them every day in the same locker rooms and they're coaching us and, and, um, and some of them were very, very sarcastic and, you know, things like that. And, and, you know, like one, uh, Terry Steinbach, who, if you were in Oakland A's, I mean, he was a catcher during some of their best World Series runs. And, um, you know, he was coaching third for his team while my son Joey was playing third, you know, and and Joey duffed a couple of balls. And he said, I got you got to get rid of Terry. He's just talking to me. He's in my head all the time. And that's the trick about professional sports. It, it was just a wonderful experience. It was the first time I'd really unplugged completely. Like I looked at my phone. Uh, on one day, I didn't look at my phone at all. And on most days, I maybe looked at my phone once just to see where Casey was and if she had texted me from somewhere else in the building. So it was about the most unplugged I've ever been. And that silly ass grin on Selena's face is because she was making sure that that I stayed unplugged. Um, and it was so good to watch. My sons are great baseball players. I've never played baseball. I've started playing softball at 25 I kept getting cut from baseball teams, so I never actually got to play. So hitting a 60-mile-an-hour fastball myself was definitely tough. I did get the bat on the ball a lot, but I never drove it outside of the infield. So my story here is to basically say that as we were learning these tricks and understanding uh, breathing exercises and all of this, I started to relate it to my business, and I'm starting to see that even simple things like physical exercise, breathing exercises and stuff like that can really help you with the things that we do that are uncomfortable. And let's be honest, if we're going to be creating leads and generating business, most of what we do to do that is an uncomfortable act. So I would like you to think for a minute about the uh, me versus me, me versus you versus me versus me, meaning this is going to be you battling you. You working to be a better version of you to create different results for you. One of the things that I asked on a coaching call I did to an entire office, I, I coach for uh, Realty One Group franchises in Minnesota. And once a month, I speak to the whole company. Uh, was I said today on that day, it was the 18th, today's the 20th, but ask yourself this question. Here I am on the 20th of December, uh, 20th of January, excuse me. And one lady said it perfectly. She said, I'm closer to February now than I am to December. And then I said, think about the things you said you would no longer do in 2023. And think about the things you said you would do in 2023 that you didn't do in 2022. And how much of those things that you said you wouldn't do are you still doing? And how much of the things you said you would do have you not yet done? And this is a very important question because we're only 20 days into a 365 day year. And if you look at it that way, you're like, I'm good. I'm good. I can, I can course correct. But if you said so much was going to get in done in January and you look, you go, oh, I'm 20 days into a 31 day month. Not so good, right? Not so healthy. And yet every day we get to start over every minute we get to start over. And when when are you really going to ask yourself, am I prepared to, what's the word I want to say, uh, pay off the bets that my mouth made before the end of the year? That's the thing I'm talking about. Katie, go ahead. I, I, you're just, I'm taking lots of notes and I'm likely to steal some of your stuff, by the way. Oh, steal away. 
Um, one of the things that I've heard, not only in the real estate industry, uh, industry speakers on real estate side, also on the mortgage side, is what we do in this first quarter, the momentum we do, the the, the learning we do, the the attempting something new and and learning and failing at it miserably and adjusting the sales. Whatever we do this first quarter will is the trajectory for your whole year because we know the statistics of who's no longer going to be in the business at the end of this calendar year. And this quarter is everything. And the 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 word I keep using for myself as well as for my clients is urgency. Right. And it's 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 easy to go, well, it's, you know, it's mid-January. And it's like, yeah, we're only, you know, okay, we're closer to the end of February. That means one third of the first quarter is almost gone. So I, I love that I'm closer to February than December. I'm totally stealing that. Okay. Um, yeah. And that was something someone said when I said, here we are on the 18th. So it was, uh, to me, it was like, yeah, that's the point. In other words, all these days have gone. But what I really want in terms, my reason for giving perspective over, am I looking at 20 days out of 31? Or am I looking at 20 days out of 365? And let's be honest, if it's only 20 out of 365, I can do a lot with the difference. And that's our own mindset. That goes back to Q versus trigger. <gasps> Holy crap, it's the 20th. And I said, I'd have this done by the 31st, right? That's a trigger. A Q, let's look at it this way. It's 20 days out of 365. I really got to start doing um, I shared with you guys, uh, if I didn't, I meant to, I think I did last uh, call about this show, this six, six episode series called Limitless with Chris Hemsworth, who is the Australian actor that plays Thor. And this was an actual documentary of things that he put himself through to learn to live a longer, healthier life. And as you looked at these six episodes, you were probably thinking, most of us were, no freaking way in the world I can ever do that. And that'd be okay because he's a 38-year-old muscle-bound man. However, at the end of each of those documentary um, sessions or uh, episodes, they told you how to incorporate what he did into your daily life. It was an incredible six-episode series and I highly recommend that you watch them Mo because there's two major things. There's the physical activity, but there's the mindset behind getting you that. It is equivalent with no doubt to you picking up the phone and starting to do FISBOs when you've never done a damn FISBO before. And yet there's tons of help out there. You can Google at, on, on Google. You guys all know where that is. You can Google and say, "Do you, could I, you know, give me FISBO scripts for realtors?" And stuff pops up. Okay, you can go to TomFerry.com or MikeFerry.com or whatever and find free scripts. But the point is, what are you doing that's pushed the envelope so far? And we're going to go into some real actual stuff now about listings in a minute. But I really wanted to start today with kind of a kick in the pants because. I had muscles that were sore that I didn't know were muscles until they were sore, okay? I looked at my, I played basketball today for the first time in a couple of weeks and I played really well, probably because I worked out so much and was, you know, my muscles were looser and all that kind of stuff. But during basketball, I found all these bruises on my upper right arm. I, I didn't get hit with anything. It must've just been the, maybe the overuse of that. But here's my point. My point is the name of the documentary, guys, was Limitless. Limitless, it's one word, and it stars Chris Hemsworth, and it's on National Geographic. I watched it through the Disney channel, okay? Uh, but I don't know if there's a different subscription for National Geographic. Uh, thank you for asking that, Katrina. I forgot to mention that part. So, um, so as I was you know, playing basketball today, I really went in there with a different mindset. What was my mindset? I'm not a professional basketball player. I, I started playing basketball at 40 years old. I was driving 30 minutes from Fremont to, I mean, from home to Fremont, which is the time it takes me to get there. And going through the mindset, I started visualizing how I would be a better player. 
okay? Have you ever visualized a positive result before you start making your calls? Most of us don't. It's not a new lesson. I didn't think of it. And yet most of us don't. If we started visualizing a more positive result that people are going to, you know, I used to love people say, well, people don't like it when I call because they're eating dinner. I go, why don't you visualize a different result that when you called, they go, oh my gosh, are you really a real estate agent? We were just talking about selling nine homes. I can't believe you called, right? And people would go to me, that's ridiculous. I go, well, how ridiculous is it that everybody, uh, that everybody you're, um, Hold on, I lost you guys somehow because my phone rang. Uh, that uh, everybody you call is going to say it's dinner time. Leave me the freak alone and hang up on you. The odds are about the same. If you think about the thousands of doors that I've knocked on and how few have slammed the door in my face, some have, but so few it's ridiculous. I used to average one slam door for every 120 doors. Not bad. One slam door, 119 either didn't open, didn't answer, or answered, and we're fine. So what I'm saying is let's let's start visualizing this better, the, you know, these better results. One last lesson I learned. We got there, and literally there were people of every shape and size that ranged from 24 years old to 79 years old, okay? I did what I tell people never to do. I went immediately into judgment of their baseball capability based on how they looked. What? Are you serious? Like, you would look at me and see a guy that's 175 pounds and say, oh, maybe he's good at baseball. I suck at baseball, all right? So, but here's what I did. I looked at people with funny teeth, uh, people that ran funny. My, if I was judgmental, I have one son that's 295 pounds. And I have another son that's five ten and a half and 175 pounds. And the, his nickname there, he has hair down to here, was both Fabio and Tarzan. That's what everybody was calling him. That's what they were calling my son. And they're completely different, but they can both hit a baseball a mile. Like they can crush the ball. 60, 70 mile an hour fastballs, it didn't matter. But then we got on on the field and I had the lesson of life. And I think God delivered it like this because I couldn't hit the ball, but that 73-year-old guy who slid like head first dive for a ball at shortstop got up and threw it to first base, and the same 73-year-old guy got up and, you know, lined a base hit to left field, and I'm I'm his, seen, his junior by a lot, and I couldn't do any of that. Then the kid that looked like he was uncoordinated as hell getting up and hitting a double in the gap in left center and running down a fly ball in left field, like such a lesson of shut up, Rick. You can't judge a book by its cover. In fact, why are you judging at all? Like pay attention. And why do why is that a lesson here? Because how much time do we spend worrying about stuff we don't control and taking that time and using it to take ourselves to another level? I've said it before. I'm saying it again. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Any thoughts, questions, ahas, comments? I'm not looking at the at the chat. So if there's anything in there, you guys got to say something. Okay, so look, I we talked to a lender the other day, and I talked to a lender a couple of days before that, and I'm, you know, and I'm constantly talking to lenders, and everybody's saying good stuff is coming, right? Like there's good horizon. Selena was telling us this morning on our call that she has coaching clients all over the U.S., and there's still short inventory in a lot of areas. In the Bay Area, a lot of our major cities dropped over 50% of inventory in the three weeks uh, after Thanksgiving and before uh, before New Year's. And all kinds of stuff like that is saying. Uh, we had a lender say they locked a six and a quarter, 30 year fixed with no points. These are great things, great uh, uh, predictions. And nobody knows for sure if they'll be true or not. But if you aren't reaching out to every buyer you've ever dealt with in the past five years that didn't buy, now's the time to call them. And you don't need to call them with trepidation. You need to call them and say, hey, it's me, Rick. Did you, by the way, did you ever buy? And if they say, yes, I did, you go, great. It's, it's a good thing you did. Congratulations. Where'd you end up? Maybe you can even get their address and start dripping on them again if you're really good at it. 
Okay. Because just because you lost one sale doesn't mean you don't fit. Do you even remember me? I didn't think you would. My bad. I never, I stopped communicating with you. There's something to do with those. But if they said they didn't buy, you go, oh my gosh, timing is excellent. Because guess what? You're not going to pay 100, 200, 300,000 over asking. You're going to pay asking or maybe a little less, but mostly right around asking. And inventory's shrinking right now. So it's a perfect time for you to jump back in and interest rates have dropped. Plus, the interest rates are projected to be under five by April. So you can get a rate, hold on to it for a bit, and then get something new when the time is right. Um, I'm going to stop right there so I can get Jason's hand. Jason, go ahead, sir. Hey, Rick. Sorry, I just... Uh... Shoot. <laughs> you, you okay? Did you throw your phone out the window? What happened? Jason, you there? You're on mute. There it is. There it is. Hey, guys. I, um, you know, I appreciate your talk on visualization um i came from a sports background so i like race bicycles kind of almost semi-pro like they fly me around anyway all to say is i know a lot of olympians like for racing bicycles and, and sports and that's literally once you get to the olympic training center they're not training you really to work out or to be a better you know they're giving you some very fine-tuned workouts but at they are talking about visualization the whole time. That's what they talk about. That's what they tell me about. Um, and, and Rick, you're nailing it while, when talking about this. If we visualize success, um, you know, and, I, I, and I'm not one of those guys that's like, you know, it's, you know, you could be any, anything you, you think, but there is truth to that. So I definitely appreciate that, Rick, that we need to hear that every now and then, that we need to visualize and when somebody, when we're making that phone call that we're answering and it's going to be a positive note, you know, not the, yes, we're going to get hung up on, but that positive note of visualizing, okay, how are we going to handle when somebody says, yes, I've been waiting for your phone call and yeah. now I'm going to sell nine properties. Yeah. So I, I, I really, appreciate <laughs> that. I, I, yeah, I appreciate so thank you for reinforcing that, Jason. I hope you can still hear me. I know you you seem like you're, um, from where I'm standing, it looks like your car is, is rolling over and you're still healthy, so be safe. Um, and what I wanted to say is in that personal development course that, uh, let's see who on here, Selena's taken it, Katie's taken it, I've taken it. I don't know if there's other people on here who have, but they teach you a, an exercise called intention versus mechanism. And this is a lot about visualization. Oh, Dennis, that's right. My buddy Dennis is on from San Francisco. He's taken it too. So intention versus mechanism, mechanism, mechanism is this, that 100% that of your ability to accomplish what you want is more about your intention than it is the how, the mechanism. Because there's all, oh, Teresa Zoki's on. I can't see all those names at one time. So there's a lot of people on here who've taken the basic. It's called the basic. If any of you ever want any information on it, you can reach out to me or Katie or Teresa or my wife, Casey or Selena. Any of us will be glad to share it with you. Um, it's actually starting in 30 minutes in Concord right now. It's a Friday, Saturday and Sunday all day uh, course. And it's offered every six weeks in about, um, I think about 13 cities, Denver and West. Uh, now, Here's what I want to say about that. We often get lost in the how. I want to do FISBOs. Well, have the intention to do FISBOs. I'm going to do expireds. Have the intention and the how will show up. If, if you understand that at one rule, I want you to all understand, everybody, including you, everybody is always in the moment doing the very best they know how, given the tools and resources you believe you have available to you in the moment. I'm going to say that again. And the reason I say this is because the criticism of parents is something that devastates me now. I never criticized my parents, ever. I always idolized my parents. Did I think they had issues? Yeah, but they were my parents. And then come to find out later, we as human beings make decisions about ourselves. We make decisions about ourselves based on what we hear our parents say to each other, to me, 
to our siblings, we make decisions. And in the same exact environment, one of five kids, there was five kids in our family, each can make a different decision that don't emulate each other at all based on hearing the same damn thing. Why am I saying this? We have to decide, right? We take responsibility for what we're doing. So why did I say that one sentence? Our parents were doing the best they knew how in the moment, given the tools and resources they believed they had available to them at the time. You are doing the best you know how. Why do I keep talking about that end part, the resources and tools you believed you had available to you at that time? Because you probably have more resources and tools available to you than you even think because you never stop to ask for help. In other words, if you scream from the mountaintop, I want to be a better realtor. I want to sell more houses. Who can help me? I will bet you a hundred bucks. Many people will step up. Many. If you tell your friend, hey, like I've told so many agents, when somebody comes to you and says, I need help, I don't know how to lead generate. If you don't know how to lead generate, what do you do? You go, I can't help you, but I know someone who will. Get on Rick's Free Friday coaching call, right? Today, someone who's on this call, and I'm not gonna say the person's name, I, we don't know each other that well. We've never met in person. We've texted, we've talked on the phone a couple of times. And that person texts me and say, hey, is there a Free Friday coaching call today? That's reaching out and asking for help, not saying Rick didn't text me any link, so I guess there's no call, right? No, it's asking for help. And it's something like for the first six years I dated Casey, she would yell across the room, is that you refusing support again? Oh, that infuriated, shut up, Katie. That infuriated me like no nothing else because I was doing my best the best I knew how in the moment, given the tools and resources I had available to me. And she'd say, do you want some help with that? I got it. Is that you refusing support again? And don't we all say, I got it, I'm good? Why? It is ingrained in us, ingrained. You don't even know what's happening that asking for help is a weakness, is a sign of weakness. And it freaking is not. It's actually a sign of intelligence. It's a sign of brightness. Lucky, did I miss your birthday? You're on mute. You're still on mute. I, yes, it was on Sunday. It Happy belated mom. birthday. Thank you. It was our harvest festival also. So. Oh, okay. Nice. Thank All you, right. sir. Yeah, sorry for the distraction, but I saw your face and I go, I forgot to wish her happy birthday. All right. You missed my birthday in August, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I won't next. Uh, happy birthday early. <laughs> okay, but so now here's the thing. Did you hear what I said? I love that, Kate, Katie, did you mean you resembled that remark when you said asking for help is a sign of intelligence? No, the like, is that you refusing support again? Like yeah. that's, I, I've absolutely done that. I've done right. like I got this. I could, and it's also part of my behavioral style that if I could, we lost you. Did we lose her? Was it just me, or did you guys lose her too? We lost experience through the pros. We lost you, Katie. There. Oh, you, you, got me? Your, you said your behavioral style. What? My behavioral style. I'm a I'm a high D, and so mm -hmm. when I'm in task mode, I have a limiting belief that if I don't do it, it won't be done right. And that's false. That's a hundred percent false. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, and I intellectually know that and I have to catch myself. So like, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm like, okay, that's now going to be in my head with Casey's voice of like, yeah. you know, is this you refusing? So, and, and actually, I mean, you were talking about the, the seminar program and that was a huge lesson for me is yeah. empowering others. Yeah. Versus I actually, prefer, now I've learned that I prefer not to do it myself because there's people smarter and better than I am in lots of different areas of the, you know, of getting things done. Yes. So. And you, wait, and what Katie just said is going to be a joy-based decision, not an ego-based decision. An ego-based decision is, well, it's me. Nobody can do better than me. A joy-based well, decision. <laughs> um, but a joy-based decision would be, there probably is someone who could do it better than me. Let me ask around, right? Let me right. check around. And every time I send out a message to a group or on a text or to in the work, you know, 
Our company has something called Workplace Chat. All these different places that I can send out, it never fails. I get help. Uh, Michelle Russell is in the Monterey area. I just recently moved to the Monterey area and I was getting my first listing. What I did, I didn't hesitate a second. Michelle, hey, I had no idea how to do a Monterey County listing. What am I, what do I not know? She sent an email this long saying, oh, there's this form and this form. And you got to talk to the city of Monterey and the county of Monterey. Da, 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 da. Did that cost me anything? No, not a thing except the time it took me to send the email to her. It's everywhere, guys. So if you want to start doing things that you made promises of in 2022, I'm going to do this and this, and you're not, it means it's either very uncomfortable, yes, and you haven't found who can support you in pushing into the discomfort, again, asking for help. All right? Look, let's be honest. This, it's, it's 934, so I really want to move on. But let's be honest. We all want to do more business. Uh, Bernadette and uh, and Bruce are starting a team and they're they're learning more. They just said in it, didn't you just say in the chat, uh, we've seen more resources for help than we could have believed, right? A ton. Yeah. And and jumping on, you know, um, Hatter got on. He Hatter's on the call from New Jersey and he reached out. And by him reaching out, all kinds of stuff, then what? Proceeded forward. Remember the poem by William H. Murray. When one commits, all sorts of things happen that one couldn't have imagined happening. That's not exactly how it says it, but kind of like that. Look up the poem by William H. Murray. And it's and if you look up the word providence moves to T-O-O, if you just Google those three words, the poem will pop up. But it's it's brilliant. And it's the universe, it's God, whatever you believe in giving you the rewards of your what's coming out of your mouth matching what you're actually doing now um i want to read what debbie said by not asking you're denying the other person the opportunity to give yep very good yeah you two you two brilliant katie and debbie uh, at opposite ends of uh what three thousand miles away from each other pacific. all right we're, 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 we're bi-coastal just yeah bi-coastal kind of one's on one coast of the pacific that's the other so <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about listings. I had done some calls early last year in 2022 on the Free Friday Coaching Call about us all becoming listing better at taking listings. And it got a really like good results. I had people text me, gosh, I want to hear more about that. So Gary Keller used to tell me, when you're talking to people about listings, the one question you want to ask is, why me? Why now? Like, why me? Why do I need to take more listings? And why now? Well, first and foremost, I'm going to give you a perfect example. Ask Selena. In October, we had listings sitting there that were dying on the freaking vine. Getting price reductions, nothing still moving. Price reduction after price reduction, nothing moving. And then guess what happened? There was that little glitch. All of a sudden, people started taking their homes off the market. And three of our listings that have been sitting around forever, all of a sudden, boom, sold. Guess what? I get paid. I get paid because I'm the listing agent. And people say that all the time. But, well, they're just sitting. Really? Are they just sitting or are you doing your job, which is convincing the sellers to do price reductions and move closer to what the market will bear? The problem is we're afraid of another uncomfortable position. We're afraid of that position also, another uncomfortable position, which is what? That I have to go ask the seller for a price reduction. Why me? Why now? Here's the answers to why me? Why now? I'm going to say, if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? I know you're going to go, look, you're just answering a question with a question. It's so that you get an idea. Wednesday on our daily huddle, which is our team, someone said, do we have any listings coming up? And I'm like, holy cow, the answer is no. I got to get my button gear. And guess what? I have a listing appointment today. That was day before yesterday. Okay, and I'm going to talk to three or four other people today about future listings because I got busy doing what I know to do. Talk to people. Why listings? Why me? Why listings? Why now? Because inventory is going to drop. Look, it's it's no miracle that we're 1.5 million housing starts short in the whole United States, but overall we're 5.5 million housing units short total in the whole US. Housing starts are brand new. Uh, total of short, meaning the number of people would really want to buy a house and the number of houses available, it's not matched. Okay, 55 million more people between 30 and 40 years old, right? 
There's a lot of them and not enough houses. So go get a listing, call it abundant thinking. Someone will buy your listing, right? I have a couple of people during the year that took their homes off the market. I'm staying on top of them, making sure I tell them, right? One's going to rent them, but another one, she says, oh yeah, we're probably thinking March, April, May. Yes, I'm watching that. I don't want to lose the listing to someone else, even if it was my listing and I didn't sell it, I still plan on getting it back. Everything is a potential listing. You want to look at expireds or FISBOs, start looking at expires from five years ago, four years ago, three years ago. When you look them up on your MLS, then go back and do a history on the address, not the MLS number, and confirm for sure that it never sold. Last way to confirm it never sold, because sometimes they sold off market without a realtor, is to go look at the tax roll and see, was there a change of owner at some point? That's my way of being very thorough before I approach the seller. If I've got a buyer and he's super interested, sometimes I'll approach the seller. But sometimes if I know the agent that had it listed before it was expired, I'll just call them, do them a favor. Hey, can you rejuvenate that listing? I got a buyer, right? So there's a lot we can talk about as far as that. But it is vital that if you have not made listings a priority and you are an independent listing agent, or you are a listing specialist on a team, or you're a team leader, now's the time to start putting daily activities into your schedule that will bring you more listings. Now, you might say, duh, everyone knows that, Rick. First, no. And even the people who do aren't actively putting something into their calendar, right? Like that's what Casey and I talked about when we were coming home from this trip is I've got to really start delineating between the two main things I do. One of the main things I do is get listings. The other one is uh, recruiting uh, to the team, all kinds of stuff. But the but I really have to make sure that I have my time allotted at, for one thing and do that one thing in it, be present in that moment, and then allot time for the other thing and then do that thing in the moment. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so... What I wanted to do also, and I'll do this over the rest of this call and the next call, is talk about some of the differences that have occurred in the listing marketplace over the past, I want to say, five to 10 years, because people often challenge me and say, what do you mean your listing uh, consultation is pretty much the same now as it was in 1997, 26 years ago? Well, because people are people are people are people right? But the difference is I had a lot of things to say in 1997 and I still have things to say, but I ask more questions now than I ever have. And I started that about 11 years ago, started asking more questions. So I got a call from a guy yesterday who's in the same company as me and he's down in San Diego and he goes, holy cow, Rick, I seen you've done some luxury listings before I'm going, he goes, the highest price of home I've ever sold is 2 million. And I'm going on a $10 million listing appointment. So I gave him a bunch of ideas and then I connected him with other luxury agents around the United States. He goes, they're not in my market. I go, doesn't matter. It's a mindset thing. It's understanding what to ask your clients. And he goes, well, what's your favorite question? Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I can't be the answer to your prayers till I know what you're praying for. Before we start today, could you tell me the four things you're most looking for in the realtor that you're going to choose? Right? Now, I wish I'd learned that in my first marriage. Honey, what do you need me to say so that we don't argue? But you don't get to do that, right? But you can do it with your listing clients. You can say, tell me what you want me to say. That's what you're basically doing. Bruce. Bruce, Rick, repeat stuff. that. Repeat that. You said it fast. Can you repeat that, please? Which part? The question the, that I the asked? Question. Yeah, the question. Yeah, the answer to your prayers. You just rolled. I know you've said it a hundred times, or probably a, a thousand, thousand times. Yeah. It rolls off. It rolls off your tongue real easy. So just. Yeah. Well, I've even had people. The only people who've ever challenged me on it is other realtors. They go, "Are you supposed to use the word prayers in a listing conference?" Shut up. You don't want to use <laughs> the word prayers. Use the word wishes. Use I can't be the answer right, to your wishes, right. you know. Right, yeah, I can't grant yeah. you your wishes till I know what you're wishing for. Yeah, but fairy godmother. I say says, this. I say, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, it's important for me to know, for you to know this, that I can't be the answer to your prayers till I know what you're praying for. Would you mind sharing with me before we get started today? What are the four most important things you're looking for in the realtor you decide to hire? Just like that. Notice my voice. That's part of the presentation. 
the sincere, lowered voice, right? What did we learn when we understood behavioral styles? How to speak such that we're touching all the behavioral styles, especially if we haven't yet figured out what's the husband, what's the wife, right? Because if you've got a D wife, which I've had happen so many times where I have a D wife and an, I, uh, an S husband, then you've got to address them because the S is afraid of change. The D wants to know to the bottom line, right? And I did that on a two and a half million dollar listing appointment. Oh, I want to say two or three years ago. And the guy leaned in, he had his wife sitting next to him and he said, I've talked to so many realtors and nobody's asked me that. I said, well, with all due respect to my fellow agents, sir, we all have a lot to say. We want to convince people that we are a step above the other so that you'll hire us. I said, but I don't like wasting your valuable time because if one of the four things is something that there's no way I can ever deliver, then I'm going to be honest with you and we can end this right now. Now, guess what, guys? Guess where this came out of? I went to a listing appointment once. This is in 1998. I was to I was being interviewed by people who had fired two realtors. Two. This so I would be number 3. I never I didn't know to ask that question. At the end of it I said, "Is there anything left that we could discuss or are you ready to sign a listing agreement?" And they said, "Oh, we won't be signing a listing agreement with you, Rick." And I said, "Oh, well, thank you for being direct and honest. Can you tell me what would I have had to do differently so that I could have earned your business? I felt like we were really connected. They go, oh my gosh, we think you're one of the best agents we've ever spoken to, if not the best. I was speechless. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm confused then. And they said, well, we've had two male realtors. And we've decided we're not going to list with another male. We're going to hire a female realtor. This is a true story, okay? This is not one I'm making up. This happened to me. And I, when I left there, I'm like, I am never, ever, ever, ever not going to ask that question because if you need a girl, I'm out. <laughs> Did you change your wardrobe? <laughs> All right. So. Having, look, number one, having a listing consultation is important, not freewheeling it. Having one, meaning knowing what you're going to say, okay? So I take a yellow pad and I uh, there's some things I do, and we're going to go through more of it on the next call than we are here because it's already 946. But what I want you to start thinking about is, number one, write this down, guys. How do I prepare to go on a listing appointment. Mike Ferry used to have a little cassette tape called 15 Minutes Before. And he would have you put that in the car and turn it on 15 minutes before you were to arrive at your listing appointment. All right? So what would it say? It would talk you up. You're gonna get this listing and things like that. But one of the things that I, I've often done is I like driving by a listing, if, if at all possible physically, long before I get it, like to take a picture of the front, but what if the front of the house looks like crap? Well, now we have the ability to download a Google Drive, uh, a Google Earth shot or so many other things uh, where you could get a picture of the home uh, and possibly not have a bunch of junk in the front yard or whatever. But the one thing that I want you to always know is that you have to be so quick on your feet that and remember this one rule. And I've stuck to this rule and people have told me I'm full of crap, but it works for me. The person who oohs and ahs the most always wins, right? And I've had people even in the house, meaning the seller or the seller's family say, now nah, you're just being nice. And I said, no, I'm being honest. Because I went into a house once where the room, the, the house was a mess. And they opened, I said, what's in this? What's behind this door? Is this one of the bedrooms? And they said, yes. And they opened it up and the walls were black. The ceiling was black. There were pictures of black roses on the wall. Okay. Um, and I said, wow, this room is amazing. And the lady said, Rick, now you're just being nice. I said, I didn't say the paint color was amazing. 
But let me be honest with you. I've listed four houses in the last month and none of them had a second bedroom anywhere near this size. And she stopped and went, oh, truthfully? I said, yes. In three of my other listings, this is bigger than the master bedroom. What did I do? I found something to compliment amidst a bunch of crap. All right, you pull up to a house and the roof is dangling, the garage door is lopsided, the cement's broken. You knock on the door, they come to the door. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, my name's Rick. You were expecting me? Yes, Rick. I'm so glad I had an opportunity to come over today. You live in an amazing neighborhood. Your house looks like crap, but you live in an amazing neighborhood. I didn't say your house looks like crap, but the point is we have to start mastering our mouth, our actions. The one thing I really respected about Keller Williams is they had a class called Train the Trainer. Train the Trainer was not just so that they could get more people to learn how to present their classes. They were hoping you'd get better at presenting at your listing appointments, right? So there was a rule. What's the rule in real estate? Three words. They're all the same. Location, location, location. And in presentation, the rule is internalize, internalize, internalize. Meaning, know your presentation so well that you can do the act of the presentation without stopping to think about what you're going to say, right? Now, do I believe that everybody has the capability of doing their own free Friday coaching call? Yes, because you all have something to teach other people. The reason I can do them without notes or having a lot of pre planning on what I'm going to say is because there's so much lessons in this head from 43 years of mistakes. So I'm very willing and easily able to say, I'm going to come to you and talk to you about what's worked, but also share with you what hasn't worked to keep you from going that way. Do you get what I'm saying? So once you start to know that you have a buyer consultation and a listing consultation, and that you, you know them by heart, you know them amazingly well, and that you have your zigs and your zags that you can do in between them, then it's always going to be you're always going to be ready for that listing appointment or that buyer that you picked up. Okay. So over the next few calls, we're going to start talking about systems and processes and how to execute. In the next call, I'm going to take you through an entire listing appointment. Does anybody want to see that? Okay. Uh, the rest of you don't get on the call then. I'm kidding. I hope you'll get on the call. Um, so <laughs> I've done a couple of listings appointments, with Patty, but they've really never gone you know, they were a little bit more loosey goosey. So, um, all right. So let's plan on that for the next call. And that'll be uh, the first Friday is, I don't even know what that's going to be. It's, uh, is it the third Friday, the third of February? Yeah. Yep. Okay. The third. Yeah. Which I will be in Hawaii. So will be 7 a.m. Hawaii time, I think. Right. Isn't that? Yes. Yes. Seven Good, eight, job. Good job. Good <laughs> job. I'm on it. I'm on it. <laughs> okay. So guys, listen, if, if there were any lesson that I would have picked out of today that I'm, that's resonating with me and I know, yes, I'm the one who said it, but I'm the one I usually, when I'm saying things like that, it's because I need to learn. You're just overhearing. And that lesson is to remember to ask for help, to continue to reach out and say, how can I get other resources to help me accomplish what I want? So um, uh, Crystal, there's a big EXP trip in Maui from the 29th to the 5th, 29th of January to the 5th. It's at the Sheraton. I believe it's called Wailoa or something like that. Um, it's in Lahaina. Uh, it's what? It's in Lahaina. It's the Sheraton in Lahaina. It's the Katapali coast. There you go. Thank you for Thank you for... Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you guys. We will see you all uh, in a couple of weeks. And thank you so much for getting on and for entertaining me as much as I hope I entertained you. Take care. Bye.